So today uh, we'll be covering um, a project that we've created called uh, WKS Cuddle. And uh, it is a way to do GitOps management for your Kubernetes clusters, it's something that we created here at Weave. So we're very fortunate to have um, Jerry Jackson, the software engineer um, here at WeaveWorks, who's worked on it, um, and also Mark Emice, and they both hail from Colorado. Uh, but just a little bit about us as a company. So uh, we are from a startup called Weaveworks, and we're uh, based in San Francisco, New York, Colorado, Berlin, and London, uh, as well as distributed teams. Uh, if you've heard of the technology RabbitMQ, I bring it up because our CEO and CTO are our um, former and uh, founding CEO, uh, CTO uh, created the technology and then the company RabbitMQ. Uh, and then they sold it off to VMware and then they started noticing needs in the containers and then eventually Kubernetes space uh, built open source projects uh, and then products that led to the creation of this, the company Weaveworks. Uh, we're VC funded um, by a variety of VCs, including Excel Partners, um, but one of our funders is also Google Ventures, uh, which I just sort of point out as uh, yet another layer of our commitment within the Kubernetes space. Uh, so much of what we've done, as I mentioned, is founded on open source. Um, some of you may have heard of WeaveNet. I think that's our first um, open source project that we created that still today is one of the premier ways of um, networking your Kubernetes clusters. Uh, we also have Flux and Cortex, uh, both of which are in the CNCF as sandbox projects, Flux most recently. Uh, you may have heard our announcement that we're in the process right now of joining Flux uh, CD with Argo CD uh, into what uh, will be called Argo Flux, it's in process. Uh, we've got many others here um, that hopefully you've heard of, and if you haven't, you could definitely check us out. Um, these are all on GitHub. Um, either on our own um, repos or, of course, the ones that are in the CNCF, uh, in the CNCF repos. Um, so check us out. Um, of course, we also do have paid products. Um, the longest product that we've had is called Weave Cloud, and it's a SaaS product that um, helps you do Kubernetes management, monitoring, and automated deployments. Um, so some of the open source uh, projects that we have, it is a hosted and enhanced version um, where all the pieces are more interconnected and with a nice UI. Uh, so especially like if you want to use um, Prometheus and get metrics, but you don't want to set it up and manage it, and um, most importantly, store the data and deal with the data, um, Weave Cloud is a great way to do that. So we've been um, running Weave Cloud now for uh, four years, and it's uh, actually run on Kubernetes on AWS. Uh, so we have experience running Kubernetes in production. Uh, so it turned out a lot of people were asking us questions about that. So we decided um, over a year ago to productize the Kubernetes layer um, that we had created to put Weave Cloud on Kubernetes. And so now that's been um, in process and finally been announced as Weave Kubernetes Platform. And um, we are the people who also coined the term GitOps, uh, especially from Flux that we created. Uh, and so that's really been taking off. So of course, to build a unique platform, we're making sure that it's a very GitOps aware uh, enterprise platform. So if you're looking to uh, get started with Kubernetes or mature your Kubernetes usage with GitOps, um, definitely check out Weave Kubernetes Platform. Um, and WKS Cuddle is a, a key part of that, so you'll be able to hear more about that on this talk. Um, and since we have experience, you know, for four years of running Kubernetes production, we do offer some consulting training and support, um, usually wrapped together with using our product. So if you're interested in any of that and you heard us for the first time now, then, uh, welcome and check out our website, weave.works. So thanks for listening. Um, a little bit of housekeeping here. As I mentioned, we have uh, Jerry Jackson, who's a software engineer in our company. Um, I run uh, the developer experience team that um, is either created or works on a lot of the open source projects that you saw, um, as well as integrate stuff with product. Um, you see here the icon of Weave user group. That's actually uh, Stacy, who's one of our community managers. So she puts together this great uh, online series. So you can see our variety of talks by our own speakers and guest speakers. So we're very fortunate to have this series here. Um, when we do these, these usually last about 45 minutes. They can be as short as 30 minutes, um, um, but they usually have around 45. And if there are tons of questions we will go over, but we'll have an absolute hard stop at 60 minutes. So uh, make sure that you submit your questions and we'll do our best to address them. 
uh, when you do submit your questions, uh, use the chat box. We use the platform Zoom, and usually you can find the button to uh, open the chat box. And when you do chat, make sure that you um, chat to all panelists and attendees, so that way everybody can see your questions, and sometimes people answer them as well, so we can have a conversation going. Um, if you don't see the button for chat, sometimes hitting escape gets you out of full screen mode, and you can find the button better. So hopefully that will work for you. Uh, so with that, I will hand over control to Jerry. And Jerry, are you going to be sharing your screen or slides? Yes, I will. Okay, so let me know if you need me to stop sharing first or whether you can take over. I'll give it a try. Uh, let's see. It says I can do it. Great. Okay, let's go here. Perfect. Okay. Hello, everybody. We're here to talk today about WKS control, as, as you heard. Let's uh, dive right in. First, I'm just going to do a quick overview of what, uh, what I'm going to cover, and then we'll, we'll get started. First, we're going to talk about exactly what WKS control is. We'll talk about what you can do with it. I'll do a demo of creating a cluster and upgrading it, and then we'll <clears throat> talk look a little under the hood at how things work underneath, particularly for people who might be interested in contributing or just would like to know uh, better how things work. And then there'll be Q&A, but as, of course, if you have a question that makes sense in context, please submit it on chat at any time and we'll try to answer it then. So let's get started. What is WKS Control? Well, it's, first of all, it, it's a tool that, oh, slides are off the screen. What the heck? Uh, I right. can see your slides. So I don't know if you have trouble seeing your own. Uh, can are other people not seeing the slides? We can see the slides. Slides look good to me. Okay. I'm sorry, uh, I don't know what to say about that. Anyway, um, and the requirements for building a cluster with uh, with the WKS controller are, are few. You need a, a description of your cluster, basically <clears throat> some networking information, some SSH access information, a little bit of boilerplate we'll look at later, and a set of machine descriptions that describe how to access the machines via SSH and what roles they'll play in the cluster. And then uh, a Git repository to, to store the configuration. And uh, the WKS control tool is currently based on version one of the cluster API specification. Uh, so the cluster API has moved on from uh, V1 and we'd like to get WKS control up to that, uh, the current level, but right now we're on V1. And what can you do with it? Well, fundamentally you can construct Kubernetes clusters using configurations that are stored in Git. And uh, right now, we, we only support CentOS 7 for the nodes in the cluster, but Ubuntu is under development. A lot of work's gone on in that direction. It's not quite complete, but will probably be done sometime in the not too distant future. And then uh, once you've created your clusters, you can manage them also via, via Git commits. You can perform upgrades. You can add and remove nodes. You can do other changes to uh, uh, to nodes as well. You can turn a master into a worker and vice versa. Uh, yes. And we might as well get this out of the way up front. Why, why would you want to manage clusters with Git or GitOps? Well, there's a lot of reasons, but a few are, are, are listed here. Some of the most important ones. Number one, uh, when you manage your clusters this way, the Git repository acts as a single source of truth. Whenever you look at the contents of the Git repository, you know that either that's the state your cluster's in or it's the state your cluster is trying to achieve. And as well, all the changes you make will be recorded and you can use all the standard GitHub tools to review and audit changes. You can ask people to submit pull requests and then you can, uh, uh, people can review them and either approve or, or uh, deny them. And once they've been approved and applied, you have an audit trail, you have history, you know exactly how you got where you want to be. And uh, also, you can always roll back. 
if, if something goes wrong with an applied change, you can revert your Git repository and the cluster will work its way back to the previous state. And if you'd like to see a more detailed discussion of the GitOps model uh, and, and what it's used for, there's a great uh, blog entry on WeWorks that talks about it. A little bit about the cluster API project that underlies uh, WKS control. It's, it's uh, intended to support managing Kubernetes clusters from within. And it defines a set of CRDs that represent machines and clusters and a few other ancillary things and specifies that there should be a goal seeking controller in the cluster that watches those machines and cluster uh, manifests and then updates the cluster to match the changes to them. And this works really well with GitOps because the cluster machine manifests can be managed just like user manifests if you were already doing GitOps via Flex, for example. So how do we set up and manage GitOps cluster with WKS control? I'll, uh, I'll walk through the, the steps here at a high level and then we'll dive in and look at what was involved in each one. So you need to set up SSH connectivity to all the machines that you might want to have in your cluster. Then you need to have, create a definition for your cluster with a few simple manifests in your Git repository. Then run the WKS control apply command to kick off the cluster creation process. And then finally, you can use the WKS control kube config command to get a kube config file that'll let you access the cluster. And that's it. When you've done that, you get a cluster up and running and you can manage it by uh, making updates to Git. So let's look a little more closely at these. To set up SSH connectivity, you need a single private SSH key that can access all the machines you want to have in your cluster. And that, that key can be associated with any user that has sudo permissions on each machine. And uh, <clears throat> these were specified, well, the user is specified in uh, the cluster.yaml file that we're going to look at in a minute. But if you don't specify it, you get the root user. And the key is either specified in a cluster.yaml file in the existing uh, GA release 0.8.1 and all releases going forward, starting with the alpha releases of 0.8.2, it's a command argument to WKS control apply. And then we say we want to define a cluster with simple manifests. There's two, uh, two files that are specific to your installation, the cluster.yaml file and the machines.yaml file that describe what you want your cluster machines to look like. And we'll look at those in more detail. There's also a couple of ancillary files at docker config and repo config.yaml that are basically boilerplate, but we'll explain why, why they're there uh, in, a, in a couple of slides. And so you have these four files. Once you define them, you commit them and push them to GitHub and, and you've got your cluster definition in place. And here's a, a sample cluster.yaml. I want to point out up front that it's divided into two parts. The uh, part above provider spec is common to any uh, cluster built on top of V1 of the cluster API spec. The part below the provider spec section is uh, specific to, to any uh, implementation of cluster API. So this particular provider spec is the WeWorks WKS control provider spec. And it has information that we need to create the cluster. Uh, it has a, it calls out the container runtime. Uh, it turns out right now Docker is the only one supported, but we have the uh, SSH user that in this case we're, we're making root. And then this set of files down here that needs a little explanation. What this represents is uh, a set of files that are going to be deployed on each host in the cluster. So for the, in, if we look at this first entry, it's got a destination of Etsy yum repos.d and kubernetes.repo. That's where the, the data being described here is going to be deposited on each host in the cluster. And then we say there's a, a source config map named repo. And there's a convention here that says in this section of the cluster.yaml, if you name a config map, there needs to be a file in the local directory that's, 
that config map name dash config.yaml. So this one would be repo config.yaml. And then the key here is the entry in that config map file that holds the data to put in the destination file. So these first two are both uh, references into the same repo config, uh, config map. And the final one is an entry, represents an entry in the Docker config uh, map. And we'll see those in a second. Any questions yet? This is the docker config.yaml. As I said, it's boilerplate. It, it's the same for any cluster being built with WKS control. And the repo config, as you can see, it has two entries. And these are all standard config map style definitions. Uh, these are the two keys we saw before the kubernetes.repo and dockerc.repo. And those contents will get deployed on the hosts when the cluster is built. And just want to call out that this os.files is a general file deployment mechanism. If, if you're creating a cluster and you want to have particular files on each host, all you have to do is specify in your cluster.yaml destination, config map name, and key, and create your local config map name config.yaml file and add the data you want to deploy under the key. And you can use that same mechanism to deploy other files if you need it for your cluster. Machines.yaml is a pretty simple uh, file. It's just a list of machine manifests. And just like the cluster.yaml, the machine manifest is divided into two pieces. We have our, the top part is common, and the provider spec is specific to our implementation. So when you define a machine in machines.yaml, you have to tell whether it's going to be a master or a worker. And you do that by putting a label on it, telling whether it's in the master set or the worker set. And then in the provider spec, we need to have uh, information about how to access the machine via SSH. So there's a, <clears throat> in this case, this machine being represented here is a footloose machine, which is a container-based machine. We'll see how that works a, a little later. But that's why it has a public address that's localhost and a SSH port that's something other than 22, whereas the private address is associated with the standard port 22. Uh, and you can also specify the Kubernetes version for the machine at, at this location. Currently, if you don't specify it, <clears throat> you end up with the version 114.1. You can specify different versions for the control plane and the kubelet, but if you just specify the kubelet, it'll get used for both. And as I said, if you leave it off entirely, you get 114.1 for both. So once you've got your cluster defined in, in GitHub, you need to run WKS control apply, which is the workhorse uh, command of WKS control for creating a cluster. So before we show how we're going to use it when we create our cluster here in a minute, I'm just going to walk through the arguments here to give you an idea of what you can do with it. Uh, so full disclosure for the, on this first argument, WKS control can create clusters without Git. Don't do that, but it can. And so the cluster and machines uh, arguments here can be used to simply pass those files directly to WKS control without them being in Git. So they're of no use to us here. You can also specify a different location for the config files than the current directory via the config directory uh, argument. There, the following set of arguments are, are important ones because they tell WKS control where to find uh, your Git repository and the important files within that Git repository. So, I'm going to actually start from the bottom because the bottom one's the most important one. The git URL is the URL of your GitHub repository. The, uh, the git branch is, if you want to store your configuration data in some branch other than master, you can. You just have to tell WKS control what branch it is. And kind of the same with git path. You can, you can use just a subset of your git repository by putting things in a subdirectory and specifying which one via the git path argument. And then finally, the git deploy key argument is, uh, uh, is 
point is a path to a file containing a private key with access to the Git repo. And we'll see how that works when we do the demo. We'll, we'll set that up. Uh, namespace, right now, by default, if you build a cluster with WKS control, all the uh, WKS components end up in the weave Kate's ops namespace. But if you have a desire to have some other namespace instead, you can specify it on the command line and they'll all get put in a different namespace. The uh, sealed secret cert and key are, are there because uh, WKS control lets you specify authentication and authorization configuration for your cluster. And it does that by, uh, by having you create sealed secrets containing the uh, PEM files for the configuration. And then you can reference them in the cluster.yaml. Those, uh, secret, those sealed secrets then get loaded into secrets in the cluster and then are loaded from there onto the hosts when the, when the uh, nodes get brought into the cluster. And finally, SSH key, as I said, you need to uh, specify a single private key that can access all the nodes in the cluster via SSH. And if you don't specify that, it defaults to a file named cluster-key in the current directory. <clears throat> and I also mentioned in 0.8.1, that key is specified in the cluster.yaml, not on the command line here, but we're not doing that here. Finally, use manifest namespace. If you don't want all the components to go in a, in a, specific, oh, sorry, in a specific namespace, you can use this flag and they'll all take whatever uh, namespaces were in the manifest in the first place. I, I don't know anyone who's, who's used that in anger. I'm not honestly sure if, if there's a lot of value there. But that's all the variety of parameters that in case control apply. For our purposes for a demo, we only need two. We're just going to need the uh, Git URL, the path to the repo, and get the deploy key uh, so WKS control can access the repo. It's pretty simple. And then I want to mention briefly Footloose because we're going to use it to create the machines that will underlie our cluster. And Footloose is another WeaveWorks project, a, a tool for creating containers that look like VMs. And it can work with either Docker containers or uh, Firecracker micro VMs via Ignite, another Weaver's project. You can think of Footloose as vagrant, but with containers, uh, which have extremely fast startup. In fact, uh, early in WKS control development, we did all our development uh, testing on vagrant. But once Footloose came out, we were able to just swap it directly out and and quickly get a much faster turnaround and much lower resource usage for our testing, which was fantastic. Uh, the demo is going to run on Footloose machines. I'll show you how to create them as part of that in, in just a second. And if you want more info on Footloose, you can uh, go look at the uh, Footloose GitHub repository. It's got some good documentation. So let's go ahead and uh, create a cluster. First, I'm going to create a cluster, uh, create a new repository in GitHub called WKS Control Demo. I think we're still looking at your slide. Oh, it didn't. Uh, oh, okay. uh, you might have to unshare and then reshare the screen. Okay, the I will do that. Terminal. Thank you. Yep. Are you seeing my GitHub? Yes. OK. So I'm going to create a new repo. I'm going to call it WKS Control Demo. Be private. Show you we can use private repos. Create that. Now I'm going to add a deploy key so that WKS Control will be able to access it. I call it demo key. Let's go create that key. Can you see my Emacs now? 
No. Gosh, this worked before we started, but this is going to be painful. Um, if you don't have any uh, sensitive stuff, you can just share your whole desktop, I guess. Um, well, make I, sure you I was doing that, but they were on different desktops. I guess I can just bring them all to one. Okay. Sorry. Um, you can make sure you don't show the participant list in Zoom for the chat. Well, let me just do this for now. I, I think I can start getting quick enough at it. It won't matter too much. Okay, yes. So let's go ahead and uh, create us a... Can you zoom in just, just a touch? Sorry? Just zoom in just one oh, increment. Okay. Yeah, that's better. Thanks. Okay. okay. So we're going to create a key, and I'm going to put it in my uh, .ssh directory under WKS Control Demo RSA. Then I'm going to grab the uh, public key and go put it into my repo. Don't worry about looking. I know that's small, but okay. Sorry about that clumsiness that it worked before. So we'll paste it in here. We're not going to have to come back here after we clone it anyway, so things will get better. I add the key. Now I have a deploy key in our repo. So do this. And okay, now we've created our repo. Oh, sh sorry, this is really messing me up. I gotta, I gotta clone it. So let me do that. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, merge these onto one screen here, in just a sec. Okay, all right. This will be a little bit easier to go through now. Okay, so now we'll clone it. Nothing in here yet. We're going to need those four files I talked about before, and I have them. I think we're looking at your GitHub page. Is that what we're supposed to be looking at? Oh, I thought I was sharing the whole desktop. Okay. It had this interesting effect where it kind of went blurry for a second and then came back into focus. Oh, yeah, here you go. Okay. See, the whole, see everything now? Yes. Okay. Yes. I think we're, think we're done with most of these issues now. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to copy these files that I already have stored in here. And now we have the four files I mentioned, the cluster machines.yaml, the docker config.yaml, and the repo config.yaml, along with one more um, one more file, the multi-master, and we'll look at that in a second. That's the uh, configuration for Footloose that will allow us to create machines. But first, let's look at our cluster and machines.yaml. Here's our cluster.yaml. It has the ciders for services and pods. It tells us our user is root, and the rest is, is boilerplate. Machines.yaml. Finds three machines, two masters and a worker. They each have a different port on, on the local host for the public address, and then they each have a private address with the normal uh, port 22. None of them have the uh, Kubernetes version called out here, so the version will be 1.14.1 on all of them when we create the cluster. Now we need to, uh, oh, we have some. 
questions? No, we were just chatting about something. Okay. It's my chat window. Okay. So we need to add these files to our GitHub repository. So let's do that. And now no containers running. We're going to do footloose create the foot, this multi master config, which by the way looks like this. So while we're doing this, there is one question if you'd like to address it now. Uh, it says, is there any reason we need to use only two masters instead of three? Oh, <laughs> sort of. It, it's mostly just because on, on my machine, it's, it's a lot quicker to build the cluster and the demo takes a long time and I want it to be done while we're, while we're talking. So, okay. yeah, no, I, I'm not suggesting this is the right way to build a cluster for, for uh, production use or anything. Um, but that, that's why. And this is the minimum I could use and be able to do an upgrade. This is a, and there's a follow-up question of why are we using the footloose command? Oh, well, a couple reasons. One, it's, it's really easy for doing a demo. Two, I thought it would be, people would be interested in, in uh, knowing about footloose as well, because I think it's a valuable tool for other purposes. Um, that, that's really all. Okay, cool. Th because effectively, the containers coming out by, from footloose look work just like a regular machine. So the, the same things you do here, you could do on any kind of hardware. Cool, thanks. So anyway, this is the, uh, this file is what a footless configuration looks like. It says it's going to create three machines and it's going to put the uh, cluster key, the private key in the cluster key file, which is where we want it by default anyway. So let's go ahead and do that. Notice it creates the SSH key and and then create some machines at just that fast. And now we have three uh, machines we can build a cluster on. So let's get our WCAS control apply on. Notice I'm just picking a pass two arguments to it, the, get UR, the URL of my GitHub repository and the path to the private deploy key that we're gonna need to contact it. I don't have to pass the SSH key as an argument because it's in the default location of cluster dash key in the current directory. So we'll go ahead and uh, run that. And off we go. Now something I wanna, we're not gonna sit here and watch this whole thing go on, but there's something I wanna point out before we uh, get away from this for a second. That you see all these undoings and undones here at the start. The reason for those is we spent a long time when building WKS control trying to figure out how to <clears throat> make things item potent. And as you know, there's a lot of uh, a lot of files and services and packages, etc., that are needed to make a, a cluster function correctly. And if we were to try to uh, decide if the system was in a state that would be uh, cause a successful cluster creation. Even if we had some kind of sentinel that said, oh, well, if this service is there, or if this file is there, we can assume it was installed. If any of those other files had been changed or modified or removed or, or services, the cluster still might fail. And rather than try to deduce if everything is in a proper state, instead, when we start on a machine here, we, we basically run the install in reverse and, and remove everything to get it down to a known state so that we can then build up from there and we know we will have a system that uh, will run correctly in the cluster. And in fact, that's how we do um, all node updates other than upgrades. Upgrades are, are handled separately because we, we use kubeadm under the assumption that uh, uh, if the cluster is already running, it's in a, a decent state to apply kubeadm upgrade. Let's see.
Okay, we have a couple of questions. So someone uh, the, the main the main question we have right now is what other providers does WKS Cuddle support apart from bare metal? For example, can you manage clusters on EKS or GKE? Uh, WK, WKS control doesn't. The uh, WKP product from Weave works works against all the backends, including the ones uh, the WKS control, bare metal, and EKS and, and others. But uh, WKS control is specifically for creating clusters given a set of machines. And, uh, cool. Cool. Um, yeah, those are our main questions. There's a question about Footloose, but I thought maybe we'll keep it at the end if we right. have time to go deeper on that. Fair enough. So anyway, uh, we'll let this go on for a while and we'll come back to it. Um, let me make this bigger since I'm not going to go full screen with it anymore. Uh, just a, an, another note about this demo. If, if you'd like to just experiment with uh, WKS control or, or with GitOps and, and maybe create a local cluster for testing, the absolute uh, fastest, easiest way would be to fork and clone the WKS Quick Start FireTube repository. If you do that, you can simply CD to the clone directory and run the setup.sh script and you'll have a cluster on top of Footloose. It will download all the required tools. It will create your cluster and machine configurations from the Footloose uh, information. It'll set up GitHub. Uh, so yeah, you can, you can get a cluster up and running in no time uh, this way. Although, you know, it's, um, it's a particular configuration. Uh, you won't have quite the flexibility that you have if you do it by hand, but that's easy to use if you want to just get started. And then I want to talk a little bit about highly available clusters, not too much, because uh, making a cluster available is not too much work on top of what we've already shown. It's mostly a matter of adding a load balancer across the API servers for the different control plane nodes. And uh, our own Chanwit Kawasaki uh, just put out a blog post last week detailing exactly how to do this and, and what's involved. And I highly recommend reading it. I think it's great. And it will tell you exactly what you need to do if you want to set something up in a production mode with uh, high availability. So before we get under the hood, I just want to go back here for a second and uh, show you what's going on with the cluster. As you can see, the initial uh, pass at setting up the cluster is completed, which means we now have a, a single node cluster. That's the initial master node. And if we run WKS control kube config, we can get a kube config file so we can look at the cluster. And it tells us that it put the kube config file in a directory under our, my .wks uh, with the namespace followed by the cluster name followed by kube config. And now that I've exported that, I can I can access it. If we look first, we'll see that there's there's the three machines we define. There's currently only one node because the rest of the nodes are being created. If we look at the pods. We can see that uh, the WKS controller pod is running, and that's what will install the rest of the nodes. And we can take a quick look at its logs, and we'll see that it's busy installing the second node right now. And sure enough, there it is installing the second master. So we'll let that run. Come back here for a minute. So a little bit of discussion about how WKS control actually does installation. That initial master node that we just looked at is directly installed by the WKS control command via commands running over SSH. And then once it's created that single node cluster and installed WKS, the WKS controller, that WKS controller will then install the other nodes and all of the installation done by either the command or the controller is performed via what are called plans and resources, which you can think of as similar to um, <clears throat> a lot of the provisioning tools uh, you might have seen like Puppet or Chef or Ansible, but tuned specifically for what we wanted to do. Resources represent individual tasks 
like uh, like uh, executing a commander script, installing a package, etc. And plans are are resources that group other plans, and that's recursive. You can have plans containing plans. In fact, we do because it's a nice way to organize the installation process. And here are the components of a running WKS control system. <clears throat> On the left, you have a GitHub repository containing the cluster machines.yaml. And potentially user manifests if you're also running uh, GitHub across your user uh, workloads. Inside the cluster, there's Flux, which is the GitHub uh, engine, or GitOps engine rather, that powers our GitOps and WKS control, which reads the changes from the uh, from, from GitHub and then applies them to the API server so that they take place. The hey, Jerry, people are asking if, if it's okay to put your um, oh. diagram on full screen mode, just while you're showing. Yeah, I think the text. Can people see the text inside the diagrams? It's a little small, but I can see it now. Oh, you can maybe you can now. maybe you can read it out as well. People can't read. Oh, sorry. They say thanks. They say thanks. Sure. So on the left, uh, it just says it's a GitHub repository with cluster manifests and user manifests. And within the cluster manifests, there's cluster.yaml, machines.yaml, etc. And then Flux within the cluster reads the changes out of the GitHub repository and then applies the changes to the API server. So it's, it's Flux that really turns uh, WKS control into a GitOps system. And once those changes have been applied to the API server, the controller has, is, is watching for changes to machines and clusters, and it feeds those changes down to the uh, cluster and machine actuators that actually do the work of managing the nodes and machines in the system. And uh, I'm just gonna go back just for a second because if once we get that uh, cluster created, I wanna start an upgrade. So we'll have time to get through it before we're done here. Okay, we're almost there. Node two is not quite ready. Let's see, let's look at our pods. Uh, they're all running, so it should come up. Oh, there we are. So let's go ahead and start our upgrade, and then we can go back and talk some more about what's going on under the hood. And to do an upgrade here, all we have to do is edit the machines.yaml file and check it in. We'll add a ver version section here. I'll add that same section to each machine. That. Push that. And shortly the uh, controller will see that, pick it up and start upgrading. So we'll come back to that. Cool. We also have a question. Oh. Um, so someone was asking um, if you already have kubeadm and kubelet, uh, installed or similar things. Does WKS Cuddle um, try to reinstall them uh, or does it see that or does it assume that something's already installed? It, it, it will reinstall them. It, it, well, so in, in, in particular cases like packages, when, when it comes time to, to, to get to that resource, it will, it will notice that the resource is there as, as a uh, that it's trying to lay down. But in general, it strips everything down and then builds it back up. Um, okay, so even if you point to a host that already has them installed, it'll, it'll try to reinstall. It will try to, to work backward and take everything off the host to get to a known state and then, and then install them from there. Okay, and then the other question I have is, what versions of Kubernetes does WKSCuddle uh, currently support or is compatible with? Uh, well, starting from 114.1 and forward uh, through the 116s we've tested so far. Cool. Um, Looks like so going back to the earlier question, the person said we have, uh, we use a golden image that has all these pre-installed Docker, Kubeadm, et cetera. And so that's why they were curious 
but it sounds like it will reinstall. Yes, it, 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 it wants to assume nothing about the hosts. So um, as I was saying about Flux, it's what makes WKS control into a GitOps system. And it, Flux will periodically check for Git updates and then apply them to the cluster. And Flux is configured with information about your Git repository, so it knows where to look for, for changes, the URL, the branch, the path. And uh, you can set other parameters as well. You can specify how often it should pull, whether it should treat the repository as read-only, and a variety of other things. There's a lot more uh, detail at the uh, Flux website. But for purposes of WKS control, you mostly don't have to worry about it because WKS control will do all the configuration of the Flux it deploys in the most common configuration that will work for you uh, in building a cluster. And this is the sort of basic uh, cluster creation flow of WKS control. <clears throat> the initial WKS control apply command will uh, first create a seed node plan that is the description of everything needs to be done to install the initial node and create the single node cluster. It will then run the plan, which will execute a bunch of provisioning actions on the seed node via SSH. And when those are done, we'll have a single node cluster, after which the seed node plan will install all the manifests we need, including the CRDs for cluster API, the uh, cluster machine manifests, the WKS controller manifest, and then Flux and any other add-ons, which will then, of course, create the WKS controller and Flux. WKS controller will then manage the rest of the nodes, creating them and updating them if they change, and Flux will feed changes from GitHub back to the cluster. So that's sort of the, uh, the path. There's a question on um, whether you have some use cases for this type of cluster lifecycle management. Well, I was just, uh, I mean, we're actually just kind of going to talk about how some of this works, but I, I mean, I wonder. And we can leave it to the end if that's better. Uh, well, I just, I can address it briefly. I mean, we think it's just like your regular workloads. We want to know the state of the cluster by, by looking at our single source of truth. Notice how I started an upgrade just by, by editing my machines.yaml and checking it in. And now if I look in our, Git, in, our, in our GitHub, there's our description of our machines and that will be matched by the cluster. We can do other changes, masters to workers. We can do all kinds of things to our, our machines and, and have them automatically maintained. And again, if things fail, we can roll back. So same sorts of things you would get from a, any sort of GitOps environment, but applied to managing a cluster. So that's another that. question, are all the Kubernetes components installed as containers or natively on the cluster nodes? I was wondering if for the demo, the nodes themselves are containers. Oh, well, they're installed the way they are always. They're, they're uh, containers and pods in the cluster. Um, we don't do anything different there. That's the, the interesting thing about Footloose is even though they're containers, they look just like machines. You can run Docker inside them, run containers in Footloose without any problem. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's very, uh, very handy for those kind of things. Because adding additional worker nodes strip the whole cluster. No, no, uh, adding a new worker node, uh, machine will, uh, will show up in the cluster. The controller will notice it. It will then create a new node for it and, uh, and it'll just get added to the cluster. And is it possible to have multiple machine actuators, which will work in parallel? I'm, I'm actually going to talk about that a little while farther into the into this. So, um, we'll, okay. we'll yes. So that. we're down to our last nine minutes. So let's let oh. you finish. And if we do have time to answer the remaining questions, especially about Footloose, we'll see what we can do. Okay. Let me, let me kind of blow through this, I guess. Then. Um, but the machine actuator is the key component that, that manages the, the, uh, the cluster. And it does node creation, node update, node deletion, gets notified of changes to machine objects. Right now it processes one machine at a time. And it, whatever task it's doing on that machine, it does it uh, to completion before taking the next one on. And there's 
effectively no memory in the, in the actuator. It, it's always starting fresh. So the, the ordering of operations performed the error returns. For example, we always upgrade masters before workers. If a worker came in with a, a higher version number on it, so it needed to be upgraded, first thing the actuator would do would be look and see if there are any masters that had not yet been upgraded. And if there were, it would error out on the worker, which would requeue it, the masters would upgrade it, and the next time through, the worker would, uh, would, look, ar would look around and see the masters were done and upgrade the worker. Um, the other important thing about this is machine actuator uh, creates a machine or, or a node by generating a plan for it, executing it, and then it takes that plan and stores a JSON representation of it on the node in an annotation. That way, when we come back for an update, we can generate a new plan and compare it and only do any work if the plans differ. Otherwise, uh, we'll just say nothing to do. And again, update tears the node down and rebuilds it, except for upgrade, which uses kube ADM. And we don't currently support downgrade. Uh, cluster actuator currently doesn't do anything because we, we don't have any properties of the cluster that we manipulate yet. And I don't know if we're going to have any time to dive into the resources and plans. Uh, let me just say that there's a variety of resource types you can use to build plans to manipulate machines. And you can look at these slides later, I guess, if you want more detail. Um, plans apply resources in dependency order. They have a dependency graph, so and they're undone in reverse dependency order. Two main plans, a seed node plan and a node plan. And uh, just one kind of interesting tidbit. When you create the first seed node, there's not enough information to create a standard node plan. So later when the machine actuator first gets started on any node, it creates a standard node plan for the seed node and annotates it so it can be treated like other uh, nodes going forward. And finally, just as an example, this is what uh, the graph representation of the seed node plan looks like. Uh, things below are the, the blue lines are dependencies and the red lines are containment. So for example, this, uh, this service is contained in this plan and depends on these other resources. Um, so that's it, maybe we have a little bit of time for questions. Cool. Um, so, we have five minutes left. I know you kind of ran through the end and maybe you, you can go back to those slides in case the questions are around resources and such. Um, otherwise, Mark's been on the chat sort of helping answer some questions. And I guess one oh, person's yeah. asking, oh. do you have any, um, yeah. Do you have any blog posts or future things to read about, uh, for example, for how to upgrade the cluster using WCase Cuddle? Is there something we already have out there or in documentation? Yes, uh, there isn't something specifically about that, but Chanwitz uh, Kawasaki's blog or post about HA also does upgrades and talks about how to do it in that blog post, so you can kind of get a two for one there. And then when can we find, sorry, oops, skipped up. When can we find these resource, the, the resource demo? I'm not sure what. Yeah, what that maybe means. Jeffrey, you could rephrase the question. Um, another question about use cases. Do you have use cases for WS, WKS Cuddle with Firecube VMs? Well, sure. I mean, in, in any kind of environment where you, where you might want, where you're prepared to run a cluster on top of VMs, which is, I, I think, a pretty broad set of use cases. FireCube gives you the same kind of, of low resource usage and quick startup that you would get from Docker containers with better security. So you could use it for a more uh, uh, serious production kind of workload than you would on top of Footloose. But otherwise, I mean, FireCube VMs work like any VMs, just uh, cheaper and, uh, and faster. Um, and so Jeffrey phrases, where can we find the resource demo? I guess these demos. 
Oh, uh, that, well, nowhere yet, but we can certainly put them somewhere. I, I, only, I built them for, for this talk. And that, okay. Yeah. And uh, so everybody here, you'll get an email from us uh, with some of these links and, uh, you know, a way to follow up with us if you have any follow up questions. Of course, the video for this is being recorded and you'll get the link to the YouTube video. So um, we can also find a way to share the demo if people are interested. We have time maybe for one last question. A lot of comments saying thanks, and this is great. We appreciate it. Appreciate the interest as well in WK Scuttle. Um, and this is open source, so you can definitely go to our GitHub page and if there's ways that you want to contribute or um, help test and, and give uh, share issues, then uh, there's definitely ways to do that. Uh, so we did have a question about um, a little bit more info on Footloose. So if you could do that in two to three minutes, um, is there anything more? I mean, you, you did talk quite a bit about it, but uh, any else, anything else particular you, Jerry, are excited about Footloose or what you find is the best benefit oh, for well, anybody's thinking to use Footloose? Yeah, as I said, I, I use it all the time, every day, because it really does work just like machines and for any kind of, of testing purposes or, or development purposes, it's, it's fantastic. I mean, you can spin up machines and shut them down and restart them in, a, in a, an eye blink. And uh, if, you, if you do this kind of thing where you want to set up clusters on top of something, it's, it's terrific. Uh, Footloose was originally specifically uh, to make uh, Docker containers but we've now incorporated uh, Ignite and Firecracker VMs in it. So you can use the same Footloose model that I used here to create a, a, a cluster on top of Firecracker VMs, which could be used in a real environment. Uh, I couldn't demo that here on my machine because Firecracker doesn't work on, on Macs. It only works on Linux. Oh. But if you were running on Linux, you could specify a backend of Ignite instead of Docker in Footloose. And this would all have run on top of um, Firecracker VMs, which is, uh, which is pretty great. Yeah. All of which have been created by members of our uh, teams here at Weaveworks. Yes. Uh, how long has Footloose been out? That's a good question. A uh, couple of years? I can't remember exactly when uh, it was being It's actually more recent than that because it came out after I started. So it's sometime in the last, I want to say, oh. late spring of last year really oh, okay he's around for longer um excellent well with that we're at a close thank you everybody for all your great questions if you have any questions that come up later um please uh, feel free to reach out by the email that you'll get um, i'm going to take over for a second here and just share our closing slides. Um, as I mentioned, this is our Weave online user group that Stacy here um, at Curate. So every two weeks, we've got all these great talks coming up. Um, so go to our meetup.com page. That's the best single source of truth to see the calendar of what's coming up and um, getting the links to, to join us here. Um, we also have other interesting links here if you're interested in uh, getting help on Slack or if uh, you're, uh, actually we have other links here for GitOps so we can follow up on our email. But if you're also learning, interested in GitOps for machine learning, we've also got a workshop list here. So uh, thanks also to Jerry uh, for your great presentation and to Mark for answering the questions on chat. So um, yeah, like I said, thanks for your questions. If anything else comes up uh, that you think of later, um, you can reach out by email or by Slack. Um, those are the best two ways that you can get a response from our team. So thank you again, and thanks for joining. See you, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>